G'day legends, I hope that you're having a fantastic Saturday and having a fantastic weekend overall. Now, after the leader of the most infamous private military contract company was killed, there's been a gap in the market. And you may have seen that there's an inside telegram joke going around that we are starting a PMC to act as warriors of the keyboard. Well, today I am proud to announce that the PMC is being launched, Willie's PMC, and the new uniforms have been designed and are in stock. So we have two different designs here. We have both of these here. So if I'm taking the piss out of Wagner Group, surely that puts me on a list somewhere and I won't be flying on any private jets. But on the left one, the, the Latin phase Contra Medicium, which translates to English against lies or contrary to falsehood, which, which we try to do on this channel as much as we can. Call out any bullshit, no matter where it is. The next Latin phrase, no lite timere amortem, translates to English somewhere of do not fear death or fear not death. And the phase encourages courage in the face of mortality and being associated with bravery and acceptance of the inevitable. So we have heaps of sizes and colors and different stuff everywhere. And the link will both be in my top comment and in the description if you would like to support the channel and join the PM. See now that some of it is a little bit pricey, and I've tried to get that as low as possible. But I went for the higher quality on all the printing and the items and whatever from there. But I want to start with something a little bit more serious, and this will get me a lot of hate. But at this point, I don't really care. YouTube flag everything I do anyway. So regardless of what side you're on, what uniform your side wears, a war crime is a war crime. Now, no one is saying that Russia has not or does not to or continue to commit atrocities in this war. Well, at least people that matter. Everyone can see that that has actually happened. I tell you, as of late, I've seen as many, if not more, videos of surrendering Russian soldiers killed by Ukrainian drones, of course, controlled by another soldier. And I fear that there are zero repercussions of this. Now, this was being shared around and, you know, you just see how people, this soldier clearly surrenders three times and dickheads like this, this NAFO fucking losers trying to, you know, sell this as it's good. After dropping it, he asked for mercy. So saying he asked for mercy, so clearly this bloody person is putting out that this is a war crime and this is not on the first occasion. Now, I'm not going to share this video anywhere because it's just disgusting. So he asked for mercy. They drop a drone on him, uh, drop a grenade on him. He's injured and then moves and then asks for mercy again. So two times. There is two war crimes committed right in this. So clearly, multiple times, he's asked to surrender, asked for mercy. So let's see how this is then taken by people. Soldiers wounded, out of combat most likely, express clear to surrender. Mercy should be granted. Deploy units to collect. He's a POW at that point. Now, go to the front. Like, like This is the sort of comeback, but this idiot's not on the front line either. Even these other NAFO guys saying this is a war crime. The guy surrendered and we're trying to own this. Or, yeah. So at the end of the day, surrender is surrender. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter if Russian, Ukrainian, foreigners, whatever. They are still protected under international laws. And let's look at what then those laws actually are. So this is Article 41 of the Geneva Convention. A person is horses to combat if he's in the power of an adverse party, but B, he clearly expresses intention to surrender on two, maybe three occasions in this, a, a, you could not be clearer, has been rendered unconscious or is otherwise incapacitated by wounds or sickness and thereby is incapable of defending himself. We see that multiple, multiple times in that. He abstains from any hostile act and does not a, attempt to uh, escape. So we, we see both sides breaking this, but at the end of the day, Ukraine is an allied country of us. I still think we need to hold the individuals responsible for this. And uh, people will come back with, well, then he's he's behind the line. There. How can we go and get him as a PW? It doesn't matter if he's behind the line or not. Unarmed, wounded, hands up, clearly is surrender. There's no ifs, no buts. That is a war crime. And sadly, this is just not rare. And there's another falsehood that soldiers in an illegal invasion don't have rights. That is just absolutely stupid and it's completely false. And you don't want that to be correct because we'll think of the other the illegal invasions of countries we've done and we'd expect rights as well. So 
I just need to say, look, regardless of their uniform, that is a human and a combatant who is protected under international treaties and laws. The same treaties and laws that Ukraine will say that they are upholding and protecting the entire world from the terrorist state of Russia and its imperialist dream. So I think they need to uphold that down to the individual level too. It's just unbelievably disgusting, these NAFO losers who sit at home thinking they're helping Ukraine. Somehow they've gaslighted themselves into this, but they, all they're doing, they do fuck all. They just dehumanize other humans and justify war crimes as long as it is one way. So that's just my little rant on this. And we're seeing this all over the line, both ways. Now, if you can, you can nitpick and count how many. Yeah, Russia has committed more war crimes than Europe. Just say Ukraine has had zero. Well, go on any drone page, any of these, and see the celebration of this happening, of these same losers who have never put on a uniform. They're sitting in their fucking basement somewhere. They're not prepared to go and do shit, and this shit happening. It's fucking horrific. And people say, well, this is just war. Well, okay, but then they're still protected by those rights, those treaties, whatever. If you're saying that this is just war, well, if it, then it happens the other way, you have to be okay with that also. That if you get conscripted by your country and that happens to you, your mate or whatever, you have to be okay with that. So no, we're all saying that this is just not war, that it's just not on. Russia needs to be held to account. Ukrainians who have done this need to be held to account. Westerners who have done it need to be held to account. Fucking everyone. I, I think the... The war crimes, it doesn't matter what uniform is on. It's horrific, especially if it's... And why Why am I more nitpicky on some of the Ukraine actions doing this? Because at the end of the day, we're giving Ukraine weapons. We're giving them training. We're supporting them no end. Like, we're, yep, we are your, your allied country. We are brothers in arms doing this. Well, okay, that's fine. But need to be held to the same standard of which we would as well. Now... A lot of people probably clicked off this, but that's still my feeling. But these people are still someone's son, someone's brother, and a combatant, and they deserve at least the basics of the um, international law protections of being a combatant, whether the war is just or not. And like I say, the truth can never harm a just cause. If Ukraine is in a just cause, cause the truth cannot harm it, cannot harm the cause. But there's some things in this which get buried by the media as well. So my rant done. I haven't done one of them for a while. I enjoy a good rant sometimes, and some people actually enjoy them too. Anyway, so Ukraine has had some strikes in the Black Sea. Let's talk over the Black Sea. We're gonna. You can look on the Telegram uh, that, and you can join the PMC and buy some merch. No, but you can uh, go on the Telegram, and more of the footage will be there. You can hear, watch it, whatever. Um, I'm just trying to see if YouTube won't demonetize something I do for once. Anyway. Over the last four days, both Russia and Ukraine have experienced unusually intense attacks deep behind their lines. There have been reports of explosions at Russian logistic sites, air bases and command posts in Crimea, the Krasnodar region, and near Moscow. It is highly likely that Russia's Black Sea fleet has again been heavily targeted. This came out just before um, the UK Storm Shadows and the French Scalpers came in. And we don't know which ones it actually is, but they're the same. It doesn't really matter. However, explosions at this airbase near Moscow are likely to be the most strategic concern to Russian leaders. This is a sensitive location because it hosts uh, specialist military aircraft as well as VIP transport for Russian leaders. This is the one we spoke about just the other day that the, uh, like the Russian RDK took uh, claim for. Anyway, reported damage to a COOT special mission aircraft is particularly relevant. The exact variant involved is unclear, but these valuable assets undertake missions which include electronic intelligence collection. Now, Russia has launched long-range strikes at targets across Ukraine repeatedly over the last week. This unusual intensity is likely partially in response to the incidents in Russia and Crimea, uh, sorry, yes, with the ground battle relatively static. Each side is seeking advantage by striking through their adversary's strategic depth. And as it says here, ground battle is fairly stable. There's not much movement. Now, I wouldn't say that these strikes are unusual for intensity. It might have been if you look back over the last six months, but as going into winter, these strikes are going to pick up just like we saw winter last year. So the uh, Black Sea Fleet's headquarters in Crimea has been targeted. And you can just see the Storm Shadow Scout missile coming in here. There's actually a clearer image I've got here of, you can see, of course, little winglets out. And there's unsure if it's two or three missiles. It's minimum two, but there might have been a third hit in here in the headquarters as well. Let's look at some more. This is the after damage. Here is a satellite image of the damage here. So major, major destruction of that area too. 
So some of the footage is fairly incredible as well. Like cruise missiles are weird when you see them flying, especially if you see them in person. It just sort of looks like they hover across. Like it's super quick, but not as quick as you'd think. But of course, these were launched from a Ukrainian Su-24 fighter jet. Now we have rumors, but we don't actually know the extent of the damage these strikes cause or what the casualties actually are. Now, a lot of people will say these headquarter buildings are just the building any anywhere where there's like decision making centers will be in a bunker or away from that building it's too obvious sort of like people are pointing out when people believe budinov was killed because the intelligence uh, building was hit but he wasn't in the building so people are pointing at things that we don't know exactly how much has actually come out how much damage there is but ukraine once again has shown that they can strike way deep into crimea and can bypass russia's air defense systems now Let's have a look at what the Secretary of the National Security Defence Council has said about this. Of course, Alexei Danilov. There are two options for the future of Russia's BSF, using my acronyms, voluntarily or forced self-neutralisation. The best and safest way to preserve the integrity and the property economic complex of the city of Akhtia, old name Sevastopol, and the surrounding areas is voluntarily shipwreck. The famous Russian military reflection... Oh, the destruction of own fleet when the enemy approaches should have time to continually and tradition of succession. So saying that they should just voluntarily shipwreck themselves back pointing at something historical. I will say too, though, Ukraine did scuttle basically all its Navy ships the day of the Russian invasion. So Russia didn't take them over. Otherwise, the Black Sea fleet will be sliced up like salami. The process process is painful, but the armed forces of Ukraine conduct precision strikes exclusively on military infrastructure there. So striking, of course, that headquarters and have struck other systems and whatever in there too. So earlier we did see, about a month ago, a Russian Rapucha class landing ship, the Olenogorsky Gornyak, was hit by Ukrainian unmanned kamikaze boats we're thinking the sea baby drone boat but we know they've got a few different types and then of course it was lying on its side on the 4th of august so we have this photo came out here this is a pretty shitty version of it but we see of course the tugboats and it was listing to port side could be wrong on that one um and so it had been struck and then we saw the major bloody hole in the side of it here now reportedly reportedly uh it has returned to Sevastopol on September the 7th after a 30 day a 34 day repair period and has been then uh, put back into service so this is now the Olenogorsky here as well when these strikes happened it was claimed that it would take five years of repairs to bring this back into service if it was actually possible to repair it at all that said some of the sources claim this are on the Russian side so I think we'll wait for further confirmation as satellite images things like this so over the past months it's very obvious that ukraine has lifted the amount of strikes against crimea and soon ukraine is rumored to be getting another long-range strike capability the long-awaited attackum missiles for their high mars systems well at least this is being reported by everyone but neither the us or ukraine have actually officially confirmed this it was released by news outlets uh, quoting un um, oh, anonymous sources. So it first came out from the NBC and the Wall Street Journal, but NBC is where we first, uh, saw it first. Unnamed US officials saying President Biden told his Ukrainian counterpart Vladimir Zelensky that Kiev would get a small number of attackums, so the armed tactical missile systems. These have a lot longer range than the current missiles in the HIMARS. The two of those met at the White House. Wall Street Journal adds the weapons will be sent in the coming weeks. Meanwhile, the Washington Post cites several people familiar with the discussion as saying Ukraine will get attackums armed with cluster bombers rather than a single warhead. Neither US or Ukraine have officially confirmed of the American media reports. There are lots of advantages to the cluster munitions rather than the single warhead. Single warhead against hard targets, things like that, fantastic. Against things, though, like um, air defense systems, Bomblets, way better for that. We saw the strike against what was claimed to be taking out the complete S-400 system, what ended up incorrect at strike two or three, because, of course, it's a, a laid-out system in bunkers, whatever, well, in dug-in revetments, that if a cluster munitions can take out multiple things on the ground, radars like that, where your single warhead is just taking out one thing, and if it's revetted in, it's just taking that out. So against systems like that, a lot. Better. Of course, hitting a building like we saw, yeah, you want single warhead. But against trench systems, 
uh, air defense, things like that. Bomblets are the way to go. So these long-range strikes are going to be absolutely setting the tone for the coming winter months. Neither Ukraine or Russia, or at least I don't believe, has the ability to launch a full-scale successful winter offensive. So what this will mean is further missile and drone attacks will be targeting high-value assets both in Russia and in Ukraine, and of course, Russia hitting Ukraine's critical infrastructure too. So one thing we have seen release is a new Russian drone. So we talked about about a week ago, a MiG-29 from the Ukrainian Air Force being hit with what we thought was a Lancet drone, but it was well beyond a Lancet's range, almost out to double the range. Now, this new drone has been released and multiple sources and photos have come out of this. And now people are saying, actually, this is what then hit uh, the MiG-29. Now, I've watched back the footage like 10 times and I just can't see well enough if it's a Lancet or this, but it's reported the new Kamikaze drone is Talmus, this is equipped with an EOS, which makes an analogue of the Israeli I, IAI Harrop. Thanks to the presence of an internal combustion engine, the drone will be able to fly much further than the electric Lancet, up to 200 kilometres, and carry a much more powerful warhead, so petrol over electric. Fuck you, Tesla. Anyway, thus in the future, Talmus will be able to destroy enemy cannon and rocket artillery much more effectively. And the presence of a cumulative warhead, also heavy armoured vehicles for the destruction of which the Lancet warhead was very often not enough. And we have seen Lancet hit vehicles and actually not take them out. We saw a Turkish vehicle the other day basically soak up two Lancets. And if it does have more bang in it, that's that's one of the things I'm thinking wasn't this that then hit the MiGs that didn't tend to have that much bang in hitting the MiG and it sort of... Mi- uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Russia's got a new drone that will be entering the front line and people have actually speculated that it may even have some level of stealth qualities, but I'm not sure with how this whole front engine bit is looking here. So one thing I want to talk about too is, of course, the beef that has been happening between Poland and Ukraine. And more has come out again today from the Polish side. But the tensions are cooling off there, but it's still pretty fucking awkward in that with the elections coming up. And one thing I was thinking is if Poland is really having this stance near into the election, well, an election in a democratic country is a popularity contest. And, well, everyone's goal is to get re-elected. So maybe they're getting this idea, well, maybe people don't want to be continually supporting Ukraine from Poland and we're leaning into a little bit more that way to try and win the election or however they're seeing their statistics. And that is one of the big things that someone like Trump is going on is we're going to stop this. And he's appealing to those people on that side. And we'll be interested to see where Biden actually runs up into the election. Of course, America is a much, much more important player than Poland is. Poland have a very, very powerful military, but nothing compared to the states and the amount of production the states can actually have. So let's go over what and then he has said. But I also want to tell President Zelensky never to insult Poles again, as he did recently during his speech at the UN. Poles will never allow it. And defending the Polish good name is not only my duty and honour, but is also the most important task of the government of the Republic of Poland. We will defend our arguments in the current geopolitical context, and we know how these arguments should be shaped. We know this, and we help by sending weapons, by organising the shipment of weapons, because now, first of all, we are arming ourselves. And the hub is, I'll pronounce this incorrectly, I know it's something completely off what the actual word looked like. This special logistics centre has worked, is working, and will work together with our allies. We know that a lot of logistics are coming into Poland, so it's a transit country like the President the Prime Minister have talked about. That is still a transit country into Ukraine, and they say Ukraine should not forget there are transit as well as heavily damaged vehicles are going back out to Poland to be fixed as well. President Duda told the private broadcast TVN24 that although Zelensky had not mentioned Poland, there was a suggestion and we all understood. And it was very obvious it was against Poland. He said that he thought what Zelensky had said was so unfair and that his words made him feel bitter. And even the most pro-Ukrainian accounts, even they were on the side of like, that's pretty fucking unfair for what Poland has actually done for Ukraine in this. Now, let's have a look at the maps. And we don't have too much map updates, but a few interesting little Movement. So, of course, Ukraine has sent the capital of Kiev. Red areas occupied since 22, and the purple since 14. The black areas are Russia's main defensive works. And, of course, what we're talking about is Crimea down here and Sevastopol. What 
is where a lot of the strikes are coming into. Now, we're going to go on the most, at least the most westerly push where we're seeing changes. We know there's crossings across the Dnieper and over all the time, but as far as main real effort pushing, it seems to be the South Oral Kiev, also known, well, really known as the Robertini Front. Some will call it the Tokmak Front. Probably a bit early to be calling it that, but Russia did make a bit of ground back in here. So this is where we were yesterday, and we did see that armoured vehicles had penetrated down into about here that then we do see this so it does look like russia has made back some ground here uh in the east ukraine has made some in the northeast here that has shape-shifted there and that ukraine has continued their push into Novopopkarivka here as well so there is more pushing and continually pushing south and to the east as well into these multiple layers of defense breaking through some layers getting some armored vehicles through there and there are some minor changes day to day trying to finish off this before then the winter really then starts setting in now up and down the rest of the line we don't see any real change anywhere including over then the daily ukraine map update the only bit where we do see a change is to the south of bakhmut of course being in klishkivka now uh, ISW had that the ukraine forces advanced to the southeast of klishkivka where then this green dot is placed. So you see these water reservoirs here, here, down through here. And of course, where this, basically where this dotted line is, is pretty much under the dotted line. You can just see the white here. That is the train line where Ukraine is pushing up, at the, yet Russia was defending heavily. And of course, this is Klishivka and this is Andrivka. That's where they have been pushing. So let's see how then this lines up against this map. And that's pretty much what we then see. So let's go back to the 21st. Of course, the train line comes through here. Let's actually bring up a a sat map so you can see this is the train line then we see that this further push push back onto the train line there that is lining up very close then with the isw map so russia exerting less control over that area then we come across onto then this map and this is the exact area we're talking about klishkivka and rivka and train line and whoop well, there we go. Look at this. This is this little bit here is what Russia was controlling, and then that has fallen back to the train line in line with multiple other maps. Now, we don't have Surek maps today, but we will talk about that tomorrow. I'm sure they will then come through. As I know, people do really like Suryak maps. Now, we do see this. We do see some changes in, of course, to the west of Svatov, or to the, sort of the southwest of Svatov, in and around this area. We do see a lot of pushing, a lot of like Russian movement down near Rahudka, but a bit south of there, we do see this. So, a significant real change to the map here. So, we see this is how it was placed then yesterday, and then this today. So, we do see that Russia did make some ground in the south, but Ukraine did make some more in the north than pushing to the east there so as russia made some they lost some back and forth and we do know this will happen in multiple locations as you know they need to move troops somewhere somewhere else they will lose some and what a lot of people are talking about is the vdv who were in bakhmut down around you know these areas and divka and rivka klishkivka kudimivka we do know the vdv have been rumored to redeploy then back into robertini so they've lost some ground in Bakhmut and they've redeployed, redeployed so Dan Robertini we have seen them make some ground and a lot of what can happen where that moves like we just saw up near Svatov is through rotation of the Russian forces there so they have rotated Ukraine has taken advantage of that and moved maybe the rotation somewhere else so both Ukraine and Russia don't have enough troops to just completely man fucking everything along the front line so there's going to be some sacrifices there but Ukraine did make a fair bit of ground and Russia did make some as well and that will just happen but that isn't shown across any of my other maps there anyway legends i hope you're looking after yourself grab yourself a hat a shirt whatever but never feel obliged you know i'm bloody fine i hope you're doing really really well have a fantastic weekend i'm gonna go have some lunch okay bye-bye cheers